thank you very much. I'm really very happy and honored to be here to be able to join in this meeting. I want to thank Ilya and the other organizers for this opportunity. It's been it's very exciting. Uh, I've been really very uh, glad to, to be able to see the previous presentations. Um, they really uh, relate to a lot of what I want to say here, and I was happy to see that that uh, these uh, very distinguished previous presenters agree with me in many of the things I'm going to say. So I'm I want to talk about the uh, the substrates of BCI-based behaviors, um, the actual uh, the substrates in the nervous system that are responsible for these behaviors. So what is a BCI? What is a brain-computer interface? I want to start out with a very specific definition that the central nervous system produces behaviors that serves the needs of the person. This, as far as we understand, is how is what behavior, what the nervous system was evolved to do. Over millions of years, that's what it's adapted to do in each of us. All its natural behaviors are produced by muscles. A BCI, instead of using muscles, a BCI measures central nervous system activity and converts it into non-muscular behaviors that replace, restore, enhance, supplement, or improve natural behaviors. This is the basic uh, picture of a BCI. Signals are acquired from the surface of the scalp or from the surface of the brain or from within the brain. They're acquired, they're assessed to measure specific features, and these features are translated into a variety of kinds of applications. They can replace normal function. They could restore normal function with FES, as you were seeing in a number of the presentations. They could, in theory, enhance normal function by, by basically supplementing what occurs during normal behaviors to make these behaviors better, to, to, um, to add, to enhance them. They can supplement by adding additional behaviors, such as the uh, control of a third arm. And most finally, and I'll emphasize this increasingly as I go along, they can be used to improve behaviors, to aid in rehabilitation after strokes, for example. So it's important to realize, and Dr. Lebedev brought this out also earlier, that BCI uses a new kind of behavior. People like to think about BCIs as mind reading, but they're not. What they do is they op offer the CNS the opportunity to develop a new kind of behavior, a behavior that's not based on muscles. Like natural muscle-based behaviors, BCI-based behaviors are learned. They're acquired through practice. This is illustrated here in a study uh, now almost 20 years ago from uh, Don Taylor and uh, Andy Schwartz's lab showing a monkey who over a period of days is using uh, cortical neurons to control movement of a cursor on a screen to targets. And you just see here that the targets get smaller. The targets that the monkey's able to hit get progressively smaller as the animal learns better control, as he acquires control of his BCI-based behavior. This is a more recent study from uh, Perdiccas in uh, Jose Mian's group of two patients, two paralyzed patients, who were learning a uh, BCI controlled video game over a period of months. And this shows for each of the patients how the control improves. You see more and more yellow over the months as their brain control of this task, of this simple video game improves. Again, this is a behavior, a BCI based non-muscular behavior that they're acquiring. So how does the central nervous, uh, nervous system acquire and maintain this new kind of behavior. I wanna start with a uh, related question. If we wanna understand how the central nervous system acquires and maintains this new kind of behavior, it would be good if we understood how the central nervous system acquires and maintains natural muscle-based behaviors. Now, over the past uh, 40 to 50 years, our concept of how the central nervous system functions has changed enormously, primarily because we become aware of the fact that the central nervous system is changing continually throughout life, that all parts of it are continually changing. 
This is a uh, huge change from the view and say 50 years ago in 1970, which was around the time that, that I became uh, um, involved in science, um, in which point the, it was thought that the central nervous system was really very hardwired. It could change very little and only in very limited ways. We now know that this is not true. The CNS changes throughout life it, there are many different mechanisms, neurogenesis, gene activation, neuronal properties change, there's synaptic changes, long-term potentiation and depression, glia change, dendrites change. Uh, there is excretion of hormones that changes. There's uh, axons sprout. All the vascular changes occur as well. All these things combine to allow the CNS to acquire and maintain behaviors. And the other thing that's become clear in recent decades is that the CNS substrate of a behavior is distributed. It can extend from the brain to the spinal cord. This is a recent study of the, uh, an fMRI study of the brain activity that's, that uh, develops when a person learns a simple motor sequence task. So there are changes that occur at multiple levels in the cortex, subcortically, and even in the spinal cord. So that this very relatively simple motor control task depends on plasticity occurring at multiple locations. It's a distributed pattern of plasticity that produces this, this new behavior, this skill. Now, in my group, we've spent now uh, close to 40 years looking at the distributed pattern of plasticity underlying really a very simple kind of behavior. What we've shown is that um, animals and people can learn to change the size of the stretch reflex. This is the knee jerk reflex produced by the very simple reflex arc of incoming um, spindle afferent input going, exciting the motor neuron and producing a contraction. So this is the, the knee jerk reflex. And we've shown that people and animals can change the size of this reflex. Here it is, the stretch reflex can change the size of it through an operant conditioning procedure. And this is our understanding at this point, relatively limited, but not in, not, uh, we do have some understanding um, of what occurs. And this, this pattern has been developed again over a, a number of decades. Uh, it's primarily the work of Shenyan Chen, Jonathan Karp, and a number of other people um, over many years now. Uh, as we understand it, the reward, the operant conditioning reward, reaches the inferior olive. It gradually, over days and weeks, produces initially over initial days produces plasticity, this pink in the cerebellum, which leads to plasticity in sensory motor cortex, which changes descending corticospinal tract output, which produces a small. This is when we're trying to make the reflex smaller. A small decrease in the reflex, and this change stays in effect over days and it gradually changes many sites in the spinal cord. So the spinal cord itself is changing here, and this leads to much greater change in the reflex. So here's the final change in the reflex, and it's being produced by this really uh, this distributed pattern of plasticity that operates as a hierarchy. The plasticity in the brain guides and maintains the plasticity in the spinal cord. So we re recently realized that we need a name for the CNS substrate of a behavior. And uh, at that point, I, I thought it would be a good idea to follow the model that was uh, first used by Sherrington in the 1890s, and when the, in which when they needed a word to for the newly recognized connection between uh, neurons. And they came up with the word synapse. He acquired that uh, primarily from consulting a Greek scholar at Cambridge who uh, based this on Greek term for a grasp, for something that a uh, holding and grasping. Um, it was developed quite, it was quite a complex process how that was developed. And so I wanted to follow the same model 
Uh, I contacted Adam Kamisar, who's a classical scholar, uh, and with the problem, and uh, he was very willing and, and very welcoming in terms of addressing it. Um, after some work, he decided that the, the, there was a very logical classical origin for what we wanted, that Aristotle and his followers among the Stoic philosophers came up with a term for the physical substrate of a behavior, and they called it a hexis. So we started with this term, and we really were kind of continuing their work because they gave this term to the physical substrate of a behavior. They had no idea 20 centuries ago what that physical substrate was. Now we're beginning 2,000 years later to have something of an idea of what that substrate is. So we really need the word that they developed. So we started with hexis. We wanted to develop from that a word that would not be confused with other things like hexane or hexagon. Um, we wanted a word that would be relatively simple to use um, and very clear. And what we arrived at after considerable work and, and discussions with other people was the term hexer. So these are hexers. This is the hexer responsible for motor sequence learning. This is the hexer underlying a uh, operandly conditioned change in a reflex. So hexers share neurons and synapses. They overlap, particularly in the spinal cord and, ex and elsewhere as well. They use the same neurons and synapses. Thus, they affect each other. And all these structures from the cortex to the spinal cord are plastic. They're able to change. So this is an example from a study done now about 10 years ago um, in which people were trained on a simple foot flexion extension task. MRI was recorded while they performed the task. They then spent several weeks learning a new dance step. They had dance training over several weeks. They then again did the foot flexion extension task and MRI was recorded during that. So the tasks looked the same, they were doing the same task, but the MRI, what they looked at was the difference between the, MR, the fMRI here and the fMRI here. And what they found was that there were differences in the CNS activity underlying the same task. Differences in cortex, differences in cortex, a number of places and also subcortically. So the, the CNS is providing, is producing the same behavior, but it's producing it differently because of this new hexer. So the old hexer is producing its same behavior, but it's producing it differently because of it's accommodated to this new hexer produced by dance training. So a new hexer, here's another example of a new hexer, in this case, reflex operant conditioning, we're changing the size of a leg reflex, affects an old one, locomotion. So here you see a rat walking along on a treadmill. You see the soleus activity. This is in the posterior calf the, of the right and left as it walks along. You see the muscle activity that's producing the stance as it walks along, right, left, right, left, right, left. A lot of this excitation is being produced by that pathway that we've changed with operant conditioning. So... Here you have the soleus burst prior to conditioning. Here's down conditioning. The burst is smaller. And here's another animal in which the reflex has been made larger. The soleus burst here during walking is bigger on the side that we've trained. However, walking is not impaired. The animal doesn't start limping. Its step length doesn't change on the two sides. It still walks along just fine. EMG and kinematic changes preserve the key features of walking, the key features of, of uh, at equal of right left symmetry, the key features of uh, appropriate step length, the key features of stable um, and equal hip heights on the two sides. So, and this shows how this and a part of how this compensation occurs. Here's the rat. You see the, uh, this is its back right leg. The rat's over here, it's walking on the treadmill. These are the joint angles as it walks along, hip and knee and ankle. So this is what happens 
this is before the reflex is made smaller. Now, when the reflex is made smaller, this ankle angle gets smaller as well because there's less soleus activity back here. This in itself would lower the hip. So the animal would be walking along tilted. This new hexer, hexer of the operantly conditioned reflex would have imp impaired the behavior produced by the old hexer of locomotion. That doesn't happen because the hip hap angle gets bigger. There's a compensatory change. As a result, the hip height stays the same. So the angles are different, but the hip height, which is a key feature, so the animal isn't tilted as it walks along, it's still stable, but that new, that old behavior of locomotion is being produced differently. And you can see that also for up training. If we simply made the reflex bigger, the ankle angle gets bigger, the hip height would go up, but that doesn't happen because this angle gets smaller. The hip angle here gets smaller, that compensates and the hip height stays the same. So the old hexer has adjusted itself. It's changed because of the new hexer. It shares neurons and synapses with this new hexer and it has to change to accommodate the changes produced by the new hexer. So in summary, then a hexer is a distributed pattern of plasticity that changes continually to maintain the key features of its behavior, things like hip height and things like right to other factors of light, right to left symmetry. This was presaged by Nikolai Bernstein in the 20th century, who referred to behaviors as biodynamic structures that live and develop. And this, uh, my friend Mark Latosh at Penn State University, who's now the principal translator of Bernstein now into, into English, uh, translated this uh, kindly for me for this presentation into Russian. So this is Bernstein's concept. Um, it's really very similar to the concept of the, of the hexer. Behavior, a, uh, the basis of a behavior that really changes to maintain the behavior. So the EMG and kinematic details may change the key features of the behavior, the essential features that identify it as that kind of behavior, it identifies it as locomotion and as normal locomotion, those are preserved. A hexer is like a person with a single purpose in life, the preservation of a specific behavior. The hexers are all doing this concurrently. They're changing overlapping neuronal and synaptic populations. Thus, each hexer is continually responding to what others have done. Hexers produce a negotiated equilibrium. All the hexers are changing concurrently. Each is maintaining the key features of its own behavior. Because they share the CNS, the aggregate process is a negotiation. Hexers negotiate the properties of the neurons and synapses they all use. They keep the CNS in a negotiated equilibrium that maintains the key features of all their behaviors. A new hexer expands the negotiation. Old hexers change in response. The details of old behaviors may change, but their key features don't. So here's a cartoon indicating that. This is a central nervous system. It has many deltas, many places it can change. Here, during uh, actually in utero, we, re we acquire flexion withdrawal responses that are appropriate. They change a certain set of properties. A little later, early in life, we learn to walk. This changes a set of properties and it also affects these guys that contribute to flexion withdrawal. So flexion withdrawal has to adjust. So this is adjusted to the new hexer. And later on, if additional skills are required, additional changes occur. And you get a negotiated equilibrium among these properties that keeps all these hexers happy. So this is a, an illustration of two hexers negotiating. Here's a given a specific neuronal or synaptic property along this axis. This is its normal range. This is a behavior that depends on that property. And when it's low, when the, uh, 
the property is within this range, the behavior is good. So this behavior, the hexer underlying this behavior, adjusts this property to keep it in a good range. So the behavior is properly performed. An additional hexer wants it a little differently. An additional hexer would be happiest with it a little over here. Between the two of them, they negotiate an equilibrium that keeps them both relatively happy. So that's the result of a normal negotiation among hexers. So taking this back to the central nervous system and what it does, which is to produce, to produce behaviors, here we have all the major areas of the central nervous system. They collaborate to control muscles to produce behaviors. They do this by continually, all the areas are continually plastic in order to optimize this output to control the behaviors. They are, this plasticity is being controlled by the various behaviors, the hexers of all the multiple behaviors that the person has acquired and is maintaining throughout life. So this is the normal nervous system. Okay, so that's the operation of the normal nervous system by our new understanding of how um, the basis of behaviors is distributed throughout the nervous system um, and all the parts are continually changing to maintain these behaviors. The individual, the hexers representing the individual behaviors are continually changing to preserve the key features of their own behaviors. So what does this say? Let, let's assume that the, the BCI-based behaviors work the same way. How does the CNS acquire and maintain BCI-based behaviors? So here's a CNS BCI system. Now you have all the areas of the central nervous system and you're taking signals from somewhere, maybe from the cortex, maybe from elsewhere, but you're taking signals here that you record. They're going to a BCI, which is producing the behaviors. You're now asking all these areas to adjust appropriately not to control through muscles, but to control the BCI. And the BCI also has the ability to change. So these, this plasticity is occurring, the BCI's plasticity is occurring to produce BCI-based behaviors. This is what could be called the synthetic hexer. Um, this is a term suggested by a collaborator, Sumner Norman, um, because it's a hexer that's made up of the natural central nervous system plus the technology that we add. This uh, plastic tech this technology with the ability to adjust on its own. So you really have two adaptive controllers here. And this brings up the issue that um, Dr. Lebedev and others were, were um, alluding to earlier, that this is a very complicated problem. The BCI operation is not a problem of of not, it's not a, we're not reading the mind. It's not a signal to noise problem. That's not the essential problem of BCI, of developing BCIs. The essential problem is getting this to work properly, understanding how we can use this, we can reorient this plasticity to a new purpose, how we can control the, how we're, we should manage the interaction between these two adaptive controllers the normal nervous system and the brain computer interface. What do we, what parts of this output do we delegate to this part, to that part? How do they interact to optimize their, their product? How are the results used to adjust the BCIs? Um, the issue of how you use sensory input and vision. And you've heard about that from Dr. Benzmaya and Dr. Miller um, earlier. Uh, the various issues that come up, the kind of science that they're doing is what's essential if we're really going to understand these interactions and be able to produce very effective brain-computer interfaces. So these are scientific problems that remain largely unsolved at this point, and there are very initial promising efforts underway to resolve them. Those problems need to be resolved for us to get the most effective brain-computer interfaces, and that presumably will happen but it's something that really needs to engage people and continuing to do that um, to get these results. So 
The implications of this situation I want to talk about for the three major BCI categories. So the first kind, uh, the ones that, that certainly gets the most attention are BCIs for people with severe disabilities. BCIs, for example, for people who are locked in with which Christoph Guber was talking about earlier. Um, these are people who've lost these normal outputs. They don't control muscles anymore. So in theory, we want them to operate this way. We wanna be able to reorient the plasticity. We wanna be able to optimize the interaction here to produce optimal behaviors. So at this point, these, these applications are relatively limited. For most people, given current BCIs, conventional technologies, muscle-based assistive technologies are much better for all but a very few of the people with severe disabilities. Current BCIs require too much ongoing support to be widely used by people, to be used by many people. They're expensive, they require personnel ongoing for use. And most of all, probably, they have what, what I refer to as the Grand Canyon problem. Um, this is something that actually Lee Miller talked about, that sort of kind of alluded to at the beginning of his talk, sort of, um, that uh, here's a person standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon. Now, there is no way anyone who, um, without a suicide wish, would use any sort of a BCI to control his body while he was doing this. They're too unreliable, they're too inconsistent, to trust in such a critical situation. And until we solve the scientific problems which people are now beginning to work on, we won't be able to change that. This problem will exist. We won't be able to use BCIs for really complex, critical things where failure is not, is not acceptable. You don't, want, you don't need 99% control here. You need basically 100% control all the time. And BCIs are, at this point, are very far from doing that for complex sorts of behaviors. So BCIs for people with severe disabilities, while they requ acquire a lot of attention and for some people can be useful in limited ways, are at the moment a relatively minor use of BCIs. They hopefully will become a great deal better in the future, but at the moment, they're relatively limited. So moving on to the second major cat category, which also gets considerable and increasing attention, BCIs for people without disabilities. These are people who have normally functioning nervous systems and are going to use a BCI for various other purposes. So basically, this is the situation. This is what we're trying to do. And it was very interesting for me putting together this slide because I, I put together this slide and it looked like this. And I thought, boy, this is a real mess. I can't show this to people. This is ridiculous. I have to simplify this. And then I realized that no, <laughs> this is realistic. This is what the situation really is. It is very much a mess. It is very complicated. Here we have this normal nervous system that's doing what it normally does and all these normal hexers are adjusting to produce normal muscle activity. And then we're asking all these areas to readjust, to change also to acquire this new kind of hexer, this synthetic hexer, to reorient to some extent the plasticity so that it, they can optimize control of the BCI, optimize the interaction with the BCI, which itself is adjusting to produce this new kind of behavior very effectively. This is a very complex situation, and it's an illustration of why all the basic problems that people are now addressing some of which you've heard about so far today, really need to be fully addressed and need to be solved before we can produce really effective BCIs for people without disabilities. So this is another illustration of that. These, I showed you this before, these are normal hexers. They're all very happily sharing this negotiated equilibrium. If we add a synthetic hexer here, we're gonna affect in very, as yet unknown ways, many of these areas. We're gonna interfere with this normal negotiated equilibrium, solving the problem, how we do this, how we get this complex, now complex system to work is a major problem that will require a lot of work. So BCIs for people without disabilities, at present they're non-invasive systems, 
that often have very major non-brain contamination from EMG and eye movements and, and other sorts of artifacts. Um, they have very minimal, basically trivial capabilities. They're much inferior to muscles and they certainly have the Grand Canyon problem. They're too inconsistent to be used for complex, um, critical sorts of tasks like this. So those two major areas are areas where a, a lot of science needs to be done, a lot of work needs to be done, and, and hopefully that will occur. And those BCIs will become much more capable and much more useful. In the meantime, the third category um, is at this point um, is promising right now. The BCIs to improve rehabilitation, the sort of work that Christoph Guger was talking about earlier, for one thing, there is a huge population could, that could benefit. The many millions of people around the world have had strokes, have other severe disabilities, cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury. There's a very large population that could benefit from BCIs, which can enhance the, uh, the results of current rehabilitation. There is no Grand Canyon problem. Perfection isn't essential. What's important is to add value. We want to be able to help a large proportion of these people to recover better. So this is the concept of BCI-based targeted neuroplasticity. This is BCI for rehabilitation. So BCI-based targeted neuroplasticity. So here you have a hexer, a nervous system, a hexer that's changed properties of specific sites so that it's appropriately performed. There's a stroke that's disabled this hexer. The hexer is now impaired. This might be locomotion. This could be reach and grasp. The idea is to develop a synthetic hexer that goes in and can change a critical property. A critical property can be improved. And this will enable improved practice of the, uh, of, by the, of the behavior that will improve the negotiation and will lead to an improved situation where this hexer is now somewhat happier or much happier than it was here, where the performance is improved um, and to the behavior is restored to a greater degree than it would be by normal rehab. So this you saw before, this is the normal range. These are two hexers that have negotiated. Suppose there's a stroke or a spinal cord injury, which takes this property and puts it here. This could be the strength of a stretch reflex. This could be some other property that the, the normal hexers cannot adjust this. They get stuck in a local minimum. They can't deal with the fact that this property is now very abnormal. And this property, if it's critical enough, may be entirely preventing practice of the behavior. It may entirely present nor prevent normal rehab. If we can go in with a synthetic hexer a hexer whose entire goal in life is to change this property. That's what it is. It's like a person that all it wants is to change this property and it adjusts that property and brings it back down into this normal range where these hexers can now take over and maintain it again. This can then go away and you now have a situation where more normal practice can occur and you enhance rehabilitation. So this is the concept of targeted therapy. This is another possibility for using it. EEG sensory motor rhythms, as we know, decrease preceding movement. This again, Christoph Guga referred to this. It was originally described by, by uh, Dr. Furchteller, now about 40 some years ago. Um, you see the decrease in sensory motor rhythms, desynchronization occurring prior to a movement. This is a, a right-hand movement. So the, uh, this is the top of the head with the nose here. The um, desynchronization is focused over the left hemisphere, left sensory motor cortex. So what um, Dennis McFarlane et al. demonstrated a num I now uh, about eight years ago was that um, if you trained a person to improve this desynchronization prior to movement, you can make the movement better. The movement time went down when they decreased the sensory motor rhythm. 
the movement error went down when they decreased the rhythm. And more recently, Picari et al. Um, in Donatella Mattia's group has applied this for stroke rehabilitation. They've used EEG and have trained people to decrease sensory motor rhythms over the affected areas of cortex during movement to improve hand grasp. And they were able to show that with the training, they improved the desynchronization over the contralateral cortex. And this was associated with improved movement and uh, with improved hand grasp and improved function measured by a number of scales. The people had, who had used the VCI versus the control group recovered more effectively because of the use of the BCI. So this is an, an area of a BCI application, which can be effective now, and it could benefit quite a large number of people. And it's very fortunately gaining considerable interest and uh, considerable attention. And there's a lot of work in this area, which is increasing, and it should, because this is something that can help a lot of people right now. So in summary, in regard to the, CN, the substrates of BCI-based behaviors, BCIs enable people to acquire non-muscle-based behaviors. We've looked at the substrates of these non-muscle-based behaviors in terms of the substrates of normal behaviors, muscle-based behaviors. And as a result of the progress of the last 50 years in understanding the, the ubiquitous plasticity of the central nervous system, we know that normal behaviors are produced by distributed networks of plasticity that change to maintain the key features of behaviors. We're calling these distributed networks hexers. Hexers share neurons and synapses. They continually adjust to each other. Thus, they maintain the central nervous system as essentially a negotiated equilibrium. It's a negotiation among the hexers. They're really like a bunch of people, each of which has a particular purpose, maintaining the key features of its own behavior, and they need to negotiate this multi-user system. They're all using the same, the same system, the same neurons and synapses. So they have to figure out how they can all use it. They can all be reasonably happy with how it's set. So a BCI creates a new kind of hexer, one that has two adaptive controllers, not just the CNS and all the various parts of the CNS, but this technology that we add on to the CNS and we connect it by taking signals out of the CNS and giving them to the technology. This is a synthetic hexer. So this is, this is similar, and this, and this produces the BCI-based behavior. And as, as I said, this raises a whole lot of problems how these two controllers get along, what each one does, how they interact with each other, how they adjust to each other. For the point of view of the central nervous system, how the various parts of the central nervous system reorient their plasticity to do this new kind of task. And if this is a normal nervous system or a nervous system that retains at least some aspects of its normal muscle function, even if it's had a stroke, um, which almost all the people with severe disabilities have some remaining uh, normal sorts of abilities. Um, that becomes the problem of, of, of uh, reconciling this new kind of plasticity with the old kind of plasticity, which it may, which it's also trying to improve at the same time or restore. So as a result of these problems, primarily present BCIs, are very simple and they're slow and they're unreliable. And we're now addressing, as you saw to a considerable extent today, the kinds of problems that must be solved for us to make them so they're not simple and they're not slow and they're not unreliable. At the same time, as a result, BCIs for communication and control are rel have relatively limited value at present. They have some value, but it's relatively limited. On the other hand, BCIs for rehabilitation are potentially very valuable even now, that we can help a large number of people if we can enhance 
if we can enhance rehabilitation, and it appears that with B using BCIs to produce targeted plasticity, we can in fact enhance rehabilitation and improve function. So it's a complicated situation um, that I've presented from the, the viewpoint of the substrates of BCI-based beha behaviors. It's uh, to hopefully my, the uh, sum total of my presentation is sobering and also encouraging. Um, so there's, some, there's a lot of science left to be done. There's a lot of things we have to understand having to do with the interaction of the controllers, with how we provide feedback, what the nature of this problem is, how we uh, control the plasticity to enable a BCI, a synthetic hexer, to operate as effectively as a normal hexer does in controlling muscles. So these problems have to be solved. If we do, communication control could become a great deal better. At the same time, we're able practically to make considerable contributions to improving rehabilitation. So it's a pretty com complicated and, and exciting situation. So many people have contributed to this work over the past now 40 some years. Um, I want particularly to bring out um, my friend Dennis McFarland, who as many of you know, most of you, probably all of you know, is a major figure in um, the development of BCIs over the past 30 years. Uh, what you may not know, unfortunately, that he tragically died unexpectedly a number of months ago. Um, so I want to recognize him. I was privileged to work with him for decades. And uh, he's really made major contributions to the development of BCIs. And the support that we've had from NIH, from the VA, from a number of uh, foundations. Thank you very much.